All right. We are just on 12 o'clock. So uh, let's get into it because um, I know that uh, people are probably busy. If you're anything like me this week, you've had a whole bunch of online meetings. Uh, I'm up here in Auckland and uh, we're homeschooling. Yay. So uh, apologies if I get interrupted at any stage with some kids uh, wanting some help with their maths homework. But there's nothing like being in lockdown yet again to appreciate um, how good, or in my case, how not so good my house is. And uh, that is the unfortunate reality for lots of New Zealanders. And that's what we're all about, is to try and make houses healthier and also uh, just better places to be which is better for everyone, not least of which uh, the productivity that we expect of people in their homes now working in home offices as well. But obviously uh, health, uh, durability, energy efficiency are also really, really important aspects. So I've got a great uh, panel for um, the uh, discussion today. And uh, thank you everyone for, for tuning in, taking out some time in your day. Uh, we will have some time for questions uh, at the end. So um, we've got a, a lineup of, of six speakers today. So we're going to go through those fairly swiftly and, uh, and then open up to some questions later on. For those that don't know me, my name's Matthew Cutler-Welsh. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be helping out with some of the um, stuff around the edges of Superhome uh, in the last a little while but um, you know, a lot of the, the big heavy lifting certainly been um, done by Bob and Martin uh, setting up Superhome in the early days and then uh, also big thanks to Ange for trying to organize everyone and uh, keep everything on track. We're also going to hear from Damien today who's been a uh, the, the man, the energy behind the Healthy Home Guide which uh, is going to be a big topic of what we're going to be talking about. So let's kick things off. Oh, and I should also just say that we, we are recording the, the session today. Um, I believe everyone, all our attendees are, um, are muted at the moment. There will be a time for, for questions. Feel free to use the chat. And um, if you want to um, ask a question towards the end, just um, pop that in the chat there and we'll try and organize those uh, towards the end so that we can have some, a bit of discussion. Okay, I'm going to hand over now to Catherine, who's going to lead us in with a bit of ba uh, a background um, about why the Healthy Home Guide is so needed in New Zealand. Um, so over to you, Catherine. Kia ora koutou, and uh, thank you very, very much, Matthew. Um, look, you know, I have on good authority that rocket science is actually less complicated than building a home in New Zealand. Well, it's certainly one that's healthy anyway. Apparently with a rocket, once you program it, it is on, on the correct course. A house, not necessarily. So um, with that, I've got a lot of people, we've got a lot of people scratching their heads as to why Asthma New Zealand sort of got waded into this. And, um, you know, don't, <laughs> don't worry, there have been many times when I've been scratching my head as well. I've sort of looked up and I thought, my gosh, you know, I think that we've waded in way too deep here. Um, the thing is, for Asthma New Zealand, we've been around for 49 years. And for 20 of those years, New Zealand has had the second highest rate of death for our under 35 year olds. And so the challenge that I have, it, it, not just to, um, not just to um, New Zealand, but to ASMA New Zealand is what have we been doing? Why is it that we have such a high rate of death and we've had that for 20 years now? Why have we not managed to make improvements? 
And so that that when I came in, that was a big part of, of my investigation. And New Zealand's got the second highest rate of prevalence of asthma in the world. So that means that we've got the second highest rate. And I wanted to understand why is that? Why is New Zealand, I mean to say this so-called country that's clean and green, has got the you know second highest rate. And there's, there's a number of things that stand out. Definitely the 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 the, the, the abundance of nature, you know, the, the particular matter of um of nature nature is that that our airways actually find it quite easy to ingest and so um, for one in five people that ingestion causes a, an involuntary reaction and basically all asthma is is, 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 is it's an involuntary it's a body trying to push that that particulate matter back out of the body. And that's what causes the inflammation, which then causes a, a contraction of the airways, a swelling of the airways, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, definitely the abundance of, of, of nature. Um, just a, a quick side story. I actually had a dame, like a real dame, um, you know, knighted with the, 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 the sword thing, um, you know, actually asked me if I could, get a petition together to actually start culling. Believe it or not, all the Pahutakawas that line uh, the waterfront of uh, our eastern suburbs because of the impact that they have um, on her asthma. Um, needless to say that I thought that there was probably other things that we were going to have better chance of achieving. But nonetheless, um, so definitely the fact that we're pet lovers is also another big thing. So um, that that it's not the pets themselves. So we've actually had people try to spray the pets with their inhalers. Don't try doing that. That it's not the pets. It's their fur and it's what sticks to their fur that actually is ingestible for, for our airways. But the, 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 the other thing that the most, probably the second, to the amount of um, nature is the quality of our homes. And so it's well known <laughs> that New Zealand has been on notice since the 80s, if not before, by the World Health Organization and the UN for being in breach of Article 25.1, of the Human Rights Declaration. And Article 25.1 states that everybody has the right to a home that keeps them healthy. And so we've actually been warned about this since the 80s. And yet we continue to have this problem. I actually did a calculation and since that, since that warning, we've had two and a half thousand people die needlessly from asthma alone. So um, Asthma New Zealand's mission is a 50% reduction in hospitalisation by 2029. And I knew that that was always going to be a big stretch. What I didn't realise was that unless we address the health of our homes, we are never, ever going to achieve it. We can throw as much medicine at it as we want. There are some amazing advancements in not just medication, but in terms of um, digital technology that enables um, people with asthma and with air respiratory conditions to manage more effectively. But even under that managing more effectively, if they're going into a house that is unhealthy, by right of passage, they are going to be unhealthy. And so, you know, it, until we address this, it, it, we really are trying to fill up a bath without a bathtub, without a plug in it. So um, that's why it's so important for Asthma New Zealand um, to, 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 to work to cohesively. That's why this guide is so important. But the guide alone isn't going to do it. This needs a whole state change. As you know, we can build healthy houses, but if the people living in them aren't living in them to keep them healthy, then we're just going to go back to square one. So this is a massive education process. And in actual fact, Asthma New Zealand is an education company. We just happen to educate in the space of health. And so that's why this is such an important mission for us. Now, some of you may be aware, late last year, we had the privilege of a documentary that aired on TV3. That documentary was um, the consequence of a, of a family that phoned us up. The mother was beside herself, two young kids under the age of five, born healthy. These kids were born healthy. 
<laughs> now with chronic illness, um, respiratory illness being one of them. And um, so we asked, could we go in and start filming this house? Could we go in and see what's going on in this house? Because every day my nurses come back from houses that they visited and the consistent thing, and it does not matter whether they are visiting patients in South Auckland, West Auckland, East Auckland, Porirua, you know, um, the flashes suburbs of, 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 of any of those cities. The consistent thing is, is noticing that in all of these houses, there are issues, whether it's temperature, whether it's ventilation, mold. And so we went into this house and I've got to be honest with you, and you'll probably all laugh at, at my naivety and my stupidity. I, I pretty much galloped up on a white stallion, thought, right, you know, in the sand leaf, so to speak, um, you know, right. We're gonna go in there. We're gonna put some, you know, some plastic bubble wrap on the windows. We can probably get some underfloor insulation, some ceiling insulation, a whack a heat pump in there. And Hal's Bells' family will be as healthy as ever and we'll be able to walk off and say, how good are we? It didn't turn out that way at all. In actual fact, I was stunned. And I, you're talking to a lay person here. I did not come into this job expecting to learn or understand what I know about buildings today um, in the way that I do. What I was stunned about was this home actually met healthy homes criteria. It already had underfloor and ceiling insulation. It already had a heat pump, all courtesy of ECA and the Healthy Homes Project, Mark, by the way. And yet this house, we put, we had um, the tether sensors put into this house. In, 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 in some of the rooms, it was reading 92% 92, 92 relative humidity levels. CO2 readings four times higher than what they should be. And yet this house meets Healthy Homes criteria. I think that was a jaw dropper for me. And, um, you know, at that particular moment, um, you know, the statement about rocket science being easier than building a healthy home could not have been more true. But I guess, you know, for, for, for me, I keep scratching my head because surely, surely, if we've got all the advancements, we have a look at a cell phone today compared to what it was 20 years ago, looks very different. But if I think about the houses that we're living in today compared to 20 years ago, are they different? What, what are we doing? How are we innovating in this space? But are we doing so in a way that's affordable and that's actually addressing the issues versus causing more? And so just to, uh, just to, 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 to um, end and, and let you know where to next for ASMA New Zealand. So we're in the process of um, filming a documentary series. And so it's going to be six episodes. And really the whole purpose of those six episodes will be to educate New Zealanders. Because we need to, the only thing ASMA New Zealand can do for the sector is educate New Zealanders so that they can support healthy homes. Because I just want to reiterate, we, we're under no illusion that you can build a healthy home, but if the person that lives in it is not living in it in the way in which it needs to be lived, it won't remain healthy. So what Aspen New Zealand can do is help New Zealanders, give New Zealanders agency to know what they can do, the little things that they can do. So that documentary series will um, air later on in the year. But I think, you know, the thing for me that I really want to leave you all with is don't think that asthma doesn't affect you. It might not affect you today, but any one of us, any one of us at any age can, can end up with asthma. More importantly, one in five people, one in five Kiwis have asthma. So you're some, so once, for those of you who are employers, you know, 17% of your staff will have asthma. Now how that affects New Zealand is asthma or poorly managed asthma, which three out of four New Zealanders are, have a direct correlation to a 37% decrease in overall productivity of a nation. 
I'd like to suggest that given that New Zealand is 42% lower than the hourly OECD average, we might want to consider that there's some correlation there, given that we have the second highest rate of asthma. We're 37, we're 42 percent lower than the hourly OECD average. So if we don't think that it doesn't affect us, it's affecting us in more ways than just our health. So with that, Matthew, I'll um, I'll, I'll sign off. And um, any questions, um, obviously put them in the chat box, or we can ask at the end. And happy to answer those. Awesome, thank you uh, for that. Uh, fairly sobering, but. Uh, uh, but very relevant uh, introduction, Catherine. Um, yeah, it'd be nice to get some of that uh, that that rocket lab funding uh, for the science of building rather than uh, pure rocket science. Anyway, let's uh, head on now to uh, Damien, who's going to give us a brief rundown. Now, uh, for those that haven't seen it already, the Healthy Home Guide, we're going to be talking about that, but um, we're not going to be covering the whole thing today because I'm going to be uh, asking Damien to uh, keep it keep it pretty tight uh, in the interest of time. But um, yeah, Damien's gonna just gonna give us a, a quick, very quick overview of, of what the Healthy Home Guide is and where you can go to find out uh, all you need to know about it. So uh, Damien, you got uh, you got the controls there? Thanks, Matthew. Cure everybody. Um, yep, I'm just gonna quick, quickly run through the, the guide. Um, housing's about people. I think uh, a lot of designers forget that that's what we're doing. We're, we're housing people. So he tangata, he tangata, he tangata, the people, the people, the people, and also looking at the whenua, the land. Um, we've come up with this anagram called uh, HEROES, Healthy, Efficient, Resilient, On Purpose, Environmental and Sustainable. Um, that's how our houses should look. The, the purpose of the guide is to provide a step change pathway to get from building code to best international practice. The guide's intended as a reference document. It's a systems thinking approach. Um, um, and it's it's not a ratings tool. Um, it's, it's, it's just a guide for best, better, best practice. And, and this sort of where we see, this is a sort of a tongue in cheek kind of a slide. This is kind of where the super home movement sees ourselves. So we're between best international practice and building code. So building code being where we are now, um, everyone agrees is not acceptable. And, and the, the start of the bridge is our, our base level, center of the bridge would be better. And yeah, top level we will get to one day is best international practice. What is a healthy home? It's a simple question. Uh, it caused a lot of drama when we were trying to put this thing together. Four key metrics, thermal comfort, visual comfort, acoustic comfort, and indoor air quality. But from our point of view, there's no point having a healthy home if it's not sitting on some firm foundations. Um, the earthquakes have taught us that. So we need to look at resilience and durability, universal design, landscaping and consider the people that are living in the house or in the home. I just wanted to quickly um, show the design matrix. So at the end of each chapter, there's a base better best summary. And then that's summarized in this matrix at, at the end of the document. Um, if, you, if you go through the document and get to the matrix, you can uh, request access to download this. Uh, I was in a design team meeting yesterday and the client had this matrix and had worked their way through it. Uh, it was amazing, absolutely blown away, fantastic. Um, I know a couple other clients that are working their way through it too. Um, this, this is a, a fundamental piece of information that you can work through with your, uh, with your clients if you're a designer, well, as a client, you can work through with your designer and tick, tick through the boxes that you you think you can meet. And it provides a really useful uh, design brief basis. I wanted to quickly show you this slide that I came across. Uh, <laughs> you know, it looks like we haven't come very far away from the bronze, bronze Age. We could just be building out of willow and straw and mud. Uh, probably do it for, what, 
thousand bucks a square meter, uh, probably less. Um, you know, that's this. That's one slide that tells you where we actually are. What I also wanted to do is um, show where the, the Healthy Home Design Guide fit uh, amongst other guides and standards. So um, the Healthy Home Standards is the standard for landlords, and we were talking to landlords about this last night, so they're probably more familiar than this than most designers. But basically heating, just heat the main living room. Home Star 6, heat the main living room. We're saying you've got to heat the whole house and maintain that temperature in the healthy, healthy range of 18 to 24 degrees, at least 75% of, of the time, and, and prove that by your monitoring. Um, insulation. Uh, we've, we've gone away from the R value to look at what heat do you need to heat the house any year what heat do you need to retain in the house over a course of a year? What is a, a kilowatt per hour per meter square uh, um, rate of, how, of heating? And, and so that's what we've looked at because these R values, uh, we've seen from research from Beacon Pathway and others that they're, they're not even giving half of what those numbers are due, due to all the thermal bridging. Ventilation. Ventilation standard and home star are the same thing, basically. Open windows, uh, kitchen and bathroom extraction fans. We're saying kitchen and bathroom extraction fans are good, but whole house ventilation system. Um, not an HRV system from the roof cavity, but a, a whole um, mechanical ventilation system is what's needed. And humidity is, is really important to control. It's, it's, it's humidity. That's, control, that's causing the mold. Um, and, and then as Catherine mentioned, carbon dioxide is also important. Why is it important? So this is a slide um, out of a house that's of mine that's been, monit been monitored over the winter. So this is from July last year. This is a bedroom, quite a well sealed bedroom. Um, someone sleeping with a door shut. You can see that the carbon dioxide levels uh, four times what they should be. Um, even downstairs, the, the carbon dioxide levels occasionally going over the 100 parts, 1,000 parts per million threshold. So this just gives you an indicator of what's happening of other, uh, of other toxins. And, and that's, so that's what it's really for. But um, until, until we did this monitoring, I know, no idea, no idea at all. So that's the, the value of the monitoring that uh, Brandon will talk about later. Um, draft stopping, air tightness, well, you know, unreasonable gaps and holes and walls is, is a pretty low bar standard. Um, no air tightness, it's still a low standard. Australia have got air tightness. So we're saying roughly, we're saying less than three air changes an hour um, is, is what we should be trying to achieve for a base level. Uh, and that compares with best level, best international practice of 0.6 air changes an hour, or on the other side, your old villa, which is probably about 20 air changes an hour. And windows, um, an upgrade of windows. So we want thermally broken windows with a, um, a, a spacer and in line with the thermal envelope, not stuck out in the cavity like they are now. So yeah, that's what that's all I've got. I will quickly swap with Bob and hand you over to Bob. Kia ora, good afternoon everybody. Um, this is a design guide that um, Damien has driven to completion and I think it's really important that we understand that design is so heavily marginalized in New Zealand. And, um, you know, I think brands tout the figure of 5% of homes are designed by architects. Most homes are just built and people taking, picking a plan out of a book and or cut and pasting something from a previous project. So 
I think as I'm a designer, so you'd expect me to, to advocate for, for better design, but I think just as a, as a community, we're missing out because people think I'll save a bit of money. I'll go straight to a builder and I won't, I'll save a few grand on getting a design done. So what's missing in this is there's no innovation. And innovation is exactly where we need to be. Um, you know, I think the famous quote from Einstein, what was it? Um, uh, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. Um, we've got to start doing things different and it's pressing and urgent. And the New Zealand building code, I think they've been negligent because they've left it alone for years and years. They're, they're talking about changing it now and they're talking about some of the right things with their building for climate change program. But let's just see if they walk the talk. They've got a terrible track record. So um, I think as designers and architects, we can do a better job of actually communicating to the public and getting alongside them and, and um, telling them what it is we actually do, you know, because they don't understand. They don't understand the value of design. And I think this healthy home design guide is a key piece. So we started the super home movement five years ago. And um, back then, you know, I was one of the people that um, Catherine is talking about. I got tipped out of my earthquake, damaged home, near new home, munted by the earthquake. And I saw the effect on my small children of moving to substandard rentals, couldn't get a healthy home. So we had to buy a home and renovate it to try and make it livable. And it took six months to even find a home to, to buy. So I think a lot of people have heard my story and probably a lot of people have um, heard about um, what we've done with the super home movement. And really what Damien and I want is people to, instead of applauding from the sidelines, get involved. And the only way that we're gonna make change is by doing it ourselves. Effectively community-based standard setting rather than waiting for the regulations to change. Because it may take years and we're not even sure if they're gonna do the right things. Um, the rest of the world has moved on. It's not, it isn't rocket science. All we have to do is replicate what they've done in better, uh, better standards in other countries. We're about a third of where most um, European, UK, Europe, actually we're about where they were in the mid nineties in terms of our building standards, a lot of them. And they're even talking about 2025 and proving their standards to be about four times what, what we are. So it's um, pretty sad. So, but, you know, and I think it's not about, um, it, we know what to do. It's not a, it's, a, it's a communication challenge. It's not a technical challenge. And it's about um, creating awareness for the consumers and education. And, you know, in a way, you guys, I don't know how many people are on this call, there's 89, 89 people on this call. A lot of you will be architects and designers. Most of us, and particularly the people on this, this Zoom, already know that we need to be doing better. It just doesn't get, it doesn't happen often because people are on a tight budget and it doesn't get well enough communicated to the homeowners why we need to do better. So people think, okay, uh, a window is a window, whether it's got three panes or two panes, whether it's installed in the right place in the wall. Um, a wall is a wall, no matter how thick it is to, to, the, to the naked eye. But people see the fancy finishes and um, the stone bench top and the, the, the fancy fittings, and that's what they focus on. And this is what, unfortunately, most builders and most architects um, struggle to communicate why we need to do better. So we need to do better at that. And this is why we've, we've started the super home movement to share ideas and to share new building um, methodologies, new techniques. And it's worked pretty bloody well. So our super home tours, we have up to 10,000 people and the consumers are actually requesting better of the suppliers and of the, the, the professionals. So that's, that's been great. So probably a key takeaway <clears throat> is a home is, a, is it's wildly complex, a home. And I think we 
we oversimplify homes. We think, you know, it's some four by twos and some corrugated iron and some aluminium windows and some bricks. But a home is a whole system and it's a matter of the relationship <clears throat> between the different elements in that system that creates a good home. And it's, it needs proper um, expert consideration. Um, so this slide here, I mean, this is starting to get a little bit embarrassing because I've been talking about this forever, but it does epitomize, I think, how we can create a paradigm shift. And, um, you know, I, I've shown this to uh, someone very high up in MD five years ago, and they said, this is exactly what we need to be doing. And I've shown it to ECA and local councils, various people. Yes, this is amazing. We'll support this. Nobody has. We've applied for funding to create this um, digital tool, which is a communica communication tool, really. But it's really a calculator. And nobody stepped up to fund this because it's quite a piece of work to create this and it needs some um, major support to do it. So the idea here is this is actually the, a, a slice through the 10 star home, which a lot of people have heard about because it's been widely exposed through the, being the first super home um, five years ago. <clears throat> I now tell people that's out of date because the home we did straight after we did those, we actually did two homes, um, was much better and it should have been called the 11 star home, but there is no such thing. So the thing about that house, or, or at least the one that we sold, the single story version, it sold for 29% more than it would have if it was a building code standard home. And it didn't cost that much more to build, probably less than 10%. But the really important thing is it has a tiny power bill. I visited a home that was completed yesterday and it, they, they told me their power bill was $3.90 last month. So. This tool here is an interactive tool. It's, the idea is it's a, there's a bit of gamification here so you can sort of have fun changing things like change the, the windows from double to triple glaze to see what that does to the performance, the um, monthly um, energy cost, the cost to build, what's the carbon footprint. And then let's just say you get to a high enough standard to have no power bill, which isn't 10 by the way, you could probably do a good eight. If, you, if, if you're comparing it to the home star scale and, and you do the right things. But sadly, home star doesn't go far enough. You need to do more than that. It's only part of the, um, part of the equation. So let's just say you get to a zero energy house and you take what you'd normally spend on your power and you put it onto your mortgage. It has a significant effect on the overall interest and the probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the size and, and value of the home. The, the term of the loan could reduce substantially. And, you know, you've got more disposable income. So other parts of the world for many years, they've had green mortgages, eco loans. In New Zealand, we've started to see some reduced interest rates, but in the UK, they do it differently. They give you, or they give you access to innovative finance where you can actually get more money to do a better job of your house. And the ongoing payments are no more because of the surplus that you have through having a much lower power bill. So the other thing that I'd like to portray in this tool is the health. So we could put a 3D person in here and um, their skin color could change if you turned off the ventilation or, um, you know, their nose might start running. They might start coughing, um, you know, if... if that they might fall over, and that's one of the 1600 excess winter mortality rate people. Um, so you could easily have, you know, the number of trips to the doctor, uh, hospital admissions, things like that, as part of this linked to the interventions that you need to make to make a healthy home. So we talked to a group of property investors uh, last night and some of them were saying, oh yeah, that's all very well, but you're just um, promoting yourself and you know, how can people afford to do this? We can't even afford to put a bathroom fan in. Um, you know, it's, it's some things that we've done don't cost more. Advanced timber framing. I thought that this jib fix idea, which this was the first house to have this, it wasn't actually called this at the time, 
this would just be the new normal because it's actually cheaper, more timber, less insulation. Um, removing dwangs. Um, there's a number of things that we went a number of stages further with this and, and developed it further. Um, you know, insulation's cheap. And if we can work out how to fit more insulation and not have three studs at the corner and not have three studs where we're joining internal walls, uh, it's a no brainer. But I'm sure some people have, have clicked onto this, but the majority of people are still having thermal bridges at the corner with no insulation. And, and these sort of problems are still there. So this sort of thing, I call it green by stealth. If it doesn't cost any more, it just should be mandatory. It should be code, but it's not. So we need to um, make people aware of these things, particularly these things that don't cost any more. Um, so I think uh, we've got these really cool um, sketches courtesy of John Baker, architect, um, and he's done a really good job of this. And, um, you know, I think it's, this is probably the next stage on from just doing enhanced timber framing and um, recessing the windows, which what, what we did in that, that previous job. But having an internal services cavity is a great move and having some ear tightness. Um, I think, you know, most people will be starting to realize that ear tightness is important on a number of levels to keep the moisture out of the walls, but also to stop the heat escaping that you're paying money to heat. You don't want it all going through gaps and, and out the window. So how everything fits together is really important. And the windows is the single biggest heat loss in most houses. And, um, you know, just by recessing the windows into the wall and having them in line with the insulation rather than out sort of overlapping the cladding where the building code tells us is going to make a significant difference. And then, um, you know, high performance windows. Sure, it costs more, but it has a really, really significant impact on your ongoing costs, but also you won't see any condensation. We, we don't know what condensation is. We don't have condensation in our houses. And that's the way it should be. In some countries, it's illegal to have a home with condensation in it. So we're doing a bunch of things to eliminate thermal bridging. So we've got this little piece of insulation even between the, the um, lintel members. Um, wherever we can, we're fitting insulation. We're, we're getting rid of unnecessary timber framing. And a key thing is insulating the edge of the foundation. And you know, sadly, some people have been um, trying this and not getting it right and just leaving a little bit of concrete at the top. Well, that's crazy because that's where you most need the insulation. It's got to be fully insulated. Um, so yeah, we've got to get the right uh, detail. So we've got to have the right, um, do the right things, but we've also got to have the right detail. Um, it's really important. So this is the first house we did with Eco Panel, and um, it happened really quickly. The slab went down and on a weekend and then Tuesday panels arrived, wall and roof panels, eco panel and CLT roof. Two and a half days later, this is what it looked like. And I texted the client and said, your house has landed, had you noticed? Um, so it's rapid, it's high quality. Um, I don't think we've actually um, seen in the industry, we've realized the potential um, the potential hasn't been realized for prefabrication. It's been talked about a lot, but it's not often done. And that's the completed house there. So th this is the house that I visited yesterday that has $3.90 power bill. You know, it'll, it'll be an interesting one to see how that goes through the winter, but I'm sure it'll be very good. So just things like shading. So getting shading on a um, mid floor on a, on a single two story house, often shading is missing. And this is all done with timber framing. I think there's one piece of steel in this and the rest of the design is all timber frame with large overhangs um, for protection from overheating because it's actually quite easy to make a home warm enough. It's more difficult to keep it cool. And, um, but it's also less energy to do a little bit of cooling on those few days of the year where it's stinking hot and you need to turn on a heat pump. Um, I don't think heat pumps are required for um, healthy homes that are designed properly, super homes um, for heating.
but there might be a few days of the year and the, the, those um, rare days when we've got a heat wave. Recessing the windows, really important, really not difficult to do. And it's actually standard practice overseas. So we're an anomaly in New Zealand, just like we're an anomaly heating one room, our living room. We're anom an anomaly with having flush mounted windows. So not everybody can afford to build a new home, a new super home or healthy home. So renovations will become extremely important and doing them properly not doing things to the healthy home standards or even to Homestar or whatever, you need, like I said before, a systems thinking approach, a holistic, deep retrofit. So even if you can't afford to do it all at once, like this is my own home, I'm about a month or so away from moving back in here after 10 years of waiting for my insurance to be paid. We couldn't afford to replace all the windows, so we replaced the large windows and the windows on the main floor with thermally broken triple glazed windows. And we know that we can come back later and the lower level we can put in new windows um, when we can afford to. Bloody insurance company didn't pay us enough money. But they didn't pay us enough money to actually fix the house to current structural standards, let alone improve the, the quality and do a super reno. So just finish off with this. Um, I think it's really important that we think about what it is we're building, the typologies, the type of houses we're actually building. Because, you know, building, if you're on a tight budget, you can just save quite a lot of money by being space efficient and just building space that you use every day instead of having a house with four or five bedrooms where you've got a couple of inch empty bedrooms. You know, only a third of homes have families in them. And this is a project where we got asked to do a social housing um, redesign. We were actually just asked to consult on sustainability. And this was the, the uh, this is currently what's there now, um, some old 1940s or 50s um, one bedroom flats, eight blocks of them. And you can see what's happening here. They've actually orientated it to the sun. And, you know, instead of orthogonal to the boundary or the streets, they've actually orientated it to the sun. The, the previous proposal, new homes was row housing, just going along the boundary with no north facing um, sun access, except for the one unit on the end, 30, 35 units. So we actually said, no, that's not going to work. You know, our, our role was to create, to do a home star assessment. Then I said, oh, there's no point because I can tell you now they're not going to be anywhere near um, home star six or seven. Um, they're not even going to reach building code or they'll struggle to reach building code. So what we did is we blew it apart and we made sure that every single dwelling had all day sun access and actually just about every room had all day sun access. There is some multi-unit across the back but it is north facing. There's green space, there's a bit more nature. And what we wanna do is, is think about, I mean, this is a few years ago now, and, um, but what we need to do is think about getting nature into our designs and getting the cars out. You know, a, a, a further improvement on this would be to remove these courtyards and turn that into orchards and have the cars on the edge. You don't need to drive up to every dwelling. I think, um, that's a key point. And we wanna, you know, we wanna be producing living villages, following the living building challenge principles and thinking about more nature and, you know, um, a lot of those really, really key things. So I'm gonna leave it at that because we've got several other speakers and um, I'll just hand over to, oh, we did have one 10 star home or a couple of 10 star homes in there, but um, we, we reduced them to seven star. <coughs> So I'll hand over to Martin Ball now, and thank you very much to NK Windows and Martin Ball for being our, hanging in there and being our main supporter and partner in the super home movement. It's much appreciated. And frankly, without them, we couldn't do what we do. Thank you, Martin, take it away. Thanks, Bob, and it was great to um, join you yesterday and have a look at that uh, home that you've just finished um, and that we've worked on together and, and uh, good to hear the results on the heating and cooling bill as well, so that's all working. Um, 
yeah, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to sit alongside Bob and, and see his personal journey as well. And, and it's interesting also to hear um, Catherine's story. And, you know, post quakes in Christchurch, um, we went into a lot of, uh, of older homes that, that needed repair and, and witnessed very similar things. So, you know, mold and moisture on, on um, glass and, and certainly window sills. And it was, it was pretty shocking. And it was one of the reasons why we decided to get on board and, and, and get more involved with Superhome. And it was a great opportunity also to contribute to the Super Home Guide. So um, as per Matthew's video, I think at some stage that I was get up, watched at some point, get off my backside and actually do some work rather than uh, <laughs> sit on the sideline and talk about it. So um, that, that's that been really good. And in that process worked with um, other window manufacturers and the glazing folks um, nationwide as well. So what's a good, what's a good window? Um, a good window, I think of it in terms of kind of frames, um, glazing, and, and kind of where you place it in the wall as the kind of three components. So um, the key really here is, is to get as good a thermally broken frame as you can possibly afford, starting with um, a thermally broken aluminium and moving up potentially into PVC and, and wooden frames. And there's good suppliers now in New Zealand of certainly PVC frames nationwide. Um, and there's some, there's some very good wooden window uh, manufacturers as well. So they're, they're now, you know, reasonably readily available. Um, so uh, I guess the other thing I spend a lot of time talking about with people is the glazing um, and a couple of key elements there. One is the, the air gap between the, the two panes of glass. So again, um, go for a window suite um, that, that allows you a, a deep air gap, ideally 16, 18 millimeters to get as much thermal performance as you can get. The air gap helps to the insulation. Um, and, and simple things like low E and, and argon. So um, they typically add about eight or nine percent uh, to the price of, of, of the window, but they double, um, typically at least double the R value performance of the window. And, and even then, um, you know, we're talking about um, even if you, if you could push your R value of your window up towards that, that kind of better standard around the 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Just remember that's still only you know a third of the value of the worst wall you can legally build. So, in truth, there's, a, there's still a heck of a long way to go. And if you, I mean, if you're at all at all not convinced about um, and need to do much better in the space, really good article by um, uh, an independent freelance um, uh, uh, writer for the Brands Magazine, um, Build Magazine, it was September last year, so issue 179, where they compared. Um, uh, climate zones in the southern part of the UK to the southeast corner of New Zealand, they're almost identical in terms of rainfall, um, high and low temperatures, things like that. Their um, building code is, is almost three times ours. So it's a, it's a real, you know, it, it's criminal. As Bob said, you know, they, they started off where we are in the 90s and they're pushing on uh, beyond where we are now. So there's certainly a lot more um, we could be doing. And, and the, probably the big breakthrough for us in the last couple of years is um, particularly was the, the location of the window in the framing line. Um, and of course, when we ring our um, friendly German suppliers up and talk to them uh, about this and how we might go about it, there was a stunned silence on the end of the phone and they said, uh, how else would you do it? Um, so <laughs> we're only, you know, I suspect 10 or 15 years behind. Um, so yeah, the modeling we've done with PVC frames, in my case, um, you know, 15 to 18% improvement in, in our value just by pulling the frame into the insulation line and surrounding the window with, with a warm wall. Um, so that makes a, a massive difference. Um, and there is some uh, design involved around, you know, flashing systems, and, but the critical thing, critical breakthrough in the last few years with the arrival of some of the European um, foam and taping technologies is being able to back up those flashing systems with, with tapes and foams and stuff. So that's been, um, yeah, that's been really, really critical. Um, so that's probably all I wanted to, to cover. That's probably the high points. Um, and uh, yeah, look forward to the chats and, um, and questions later on. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Martin, and, uh, and also Damien and Bob there as well. So we're just going to swap over screens now. We've got uh, 10 minutes left to go and we've got two more um, quick speakers. So Bob, I think you're still uh, sharing. Are you able to um, unshare your screen? We're going to hand over controls to Brad from Terralana. So that looks like you, Brad. Awesome. Uh, we're up and running. 
I'll, I'll hand straight over to you. Uh, uh, just a quick mention to say that Brad's, uh, a lot of you will know Brad's been a great supporter and, uh, in this space as well. Done a lot of work promoting the benefits, not just of uh, Terralana, but just insulation in general. So uh, I think you're on, you can be yes, heard you as hear well. me all right? Yep. yep. Good to great. go. Great. Thanks, Matthew. And and Martin, yeah, thank you for, uh, you know, I'm, I'm as an insulation Specialist, I, I'm always learning in this space, and and I just want to have a massive shout out to Bob and 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 Damien and you know like Catherine coming on board today, like just learning all the time. I just love it. Great industry, wouldn't you? You just wouldn't be in any other industry, right? Uh, hey, look, yeah, my name is Brad Stewart, and um, and I'm the installation specialist at Terralana. Now we're we're in full support of the Healthy Home Guide, and and as a company. We're, we're based in Christchurch and, and we're fully committed to providing healthy, sustainable solutions into the insulation space. And I think that's really important for everyone to, to hear that, uh, that we're passionate about it. You know, we're not just about, uh, sure, every, every business needs to make a profit, but we're passionate about providing better solutions, innovation. All of these things are coming through in, in what people are saying. So for us, um, you know, we are a, a Christchurch manufacturer of this stuff here, sheep's wool. And, um, and we turn it into this stuff here. So awesome insulation. So um, from, from our perspective, from my perspective, insulation is a massive problem in New Zealand. Uh, a lot of you may not think that, but um, from, from what I see in the market, uh, we're, we're specifying to code minimums often. Uh, and this won't be all of you, that's for sure, but I see it a lot. We specify to code minimums. Theoretical R values are driving performance. And that's right through the industry. Homeowners think once, and I know Bob, uh, I think Bob or Damien touched on that. Uh, we have an insulation standard that is based on the cheapest and fastest, and uh, is just appalling in a lot of cases. And, you know, we, I think we all need to demand better of the industry uh, around insulation, around uh, the supply of products, uh, around the waste management of, of the products on site and the installing of these products. You can have the best product in the world, but if it's not installed correctly, it's going to compromise everything you're trying to achieve. So unfortunately, I just wanted to touch a bit on price. So price often drives material choice, right? And um, especially with products that are unseen. So products that are in the thermal envelope. So whether that is insulation, ventilation, and air tightness, uh, people, uh, we're, we're trying to, we need to educate homeowners uh, to invest in these areas. And we're, you know, that's a responsibility for all of us. It's, it's me, it's you. Uh, we need to be uh, building, designing, building and manufacturing products that last 50 to 100 years. Not, not 15, not 25, 50 to 100 years. We, we, um, trends change. And don't they? I mean, we, we want to change our kitchens and we want to, you know, we want to put a new hardwood deck down and, and those things change. But uh, the in integrity of a building is the thermal envelope of the building and uh, the cost to change that is, is significant. We're seeing that right throughout uh, the country with, with the, uh, the government schemes and programs coming through. It's a massive costly exercise. Do it once, do it right. Uh, and I, I just found it so interesting how ignorant we can be. Uh, thing, what Catherine was saying about the asthma stats is just, I've been juggling that around my head around, you know, one in seven kids have asthma, one in eight adults. I hope that's correct. Um, uh, but that, it's just the shocking stats. And the only way that we're going to help improve those is, is building healthier homes. So uh, from, I wanted to keep this brief. So I hope that's really, helped not only to get across um, my our passion for for the industry for the the healthy homes guide and for this movement that we are working towards healthier uh, more durable high performing homes and and just yeah we've um, we just need to get on board and work together so what I I've got a wee short video that, that just really shows a bit about what we do and um, as, as a company, Terralana. So I'll just jump onto that now.
I missed that slide. <laughs> I, I, I think this slide obviously encapsulates what I was talking about and, you know, the, the importance of those things. We'll shoot through this. Thank you for to um, to watch that and uh, look. Hopefully, yeah, we're a local company and as I said earlier, passionate about um, what we're all doing here. So sorry, Brandon, if I took up too much of your space there, but um, yeah, on to you. Very good. Uh, well worth it, Brad. Thanks for all your uh, ongoing work, um, Brandon. Are you? Uh, you see my screen? Okay. Swapping? Yep. Uh, no, I could still got Brad's uh, screen. In my oh, there we go. Yep, you're all good to go. Awesome, thank you. I I have no time. I realize people have time for it. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is just open with a statement that my mother always used to tell me. Still tells me to this day. She says, "Don't listen to what people say. Watch what they do." So I'm talking about the evidence. Where is the evidence? Uh, you can say that your home is healthy, you can say it's energy efficient, but without actually modeling it and monitoring it effectively and providing the evidence, uh, you can never prove it. And this is a very, very uncomfortable conversation for people to have because sometimes you hang your hat on a particular model or you hang your hat on an outcome and you don't want to be proven wrong. You know, you have a lot riding on being proven right. Um, but I believe that people should become less, com uh, will become more comfortable with actually being evidence-based and data-driven. So I'm gonna fly through my analogy of a car. Uh, would you ever drive a car, just as a general question, think to yourself, would you ever drive a car that doesn't have a warrant of fitness? Would you ever take your kids to school uh, when you don't have any understanding of whether there's gas in the tank or oil in the engine or whether the tires are flat? No, is the, is the answer. So why do we live in houses without understanding how they perform? Why do we live in houses um, without actually knowing how are they going on a daily basis? Monitoring uh, and modeling is required for this. A bit like a car, your houses should be able to talk to you. They should be able to give you feedback. And you as uh, someone living or managing a property should be able to take, take that feedback and change the way things are done, improve uh, the, the house based on that feedback. Cars are obviously quite different to houses because they are built at scale. And when something is built at scale, you understand all the context of the car. Do you understand that the, that the gas tank is empty because you have a sensor in the gas tank and you'll know when it's empty. Same thing with oil and tires. It becomes quite difficult with houses because every single house is different. So how do you apply the same sort of feedback mechanism that you have in a car to a house? Well, uh, we believe we one of the businesses that are trying to do that by providing contextualized data, so that meaning we apply sensors to a space that we know exists, which allows that data to become meaningful at scale. The other thing that we're looking at is that a healthy home is a two-sided equation, right? Just like a car, if you have an absolute dunger, you can't take it on a racetrack and expect it to win. Um, but you can also you know, put the best Lewis Hamilton car driver 
um, and they may do a, you know well in a race, but they'll never beat an average driver in a in a Formula One car. So there is this two-sided equation: is it the house that is the problem, or is it the operator that's the problem? The only thing that can inform this is essentially data. You need information, you need continuous information about how a home is performing uh, to be able to train the person to drive the car better, but also to improve the car, to just carry on on that uh, analogy. So if I have a range of sensors in a house, if I have environmental quality sensors, energy consumption sensors, smoke alarms, gas consumption, a whole range of different sensors in a home, um, in a way that is contextualized. So I know where these sensors are placed and what the, the room that they're placed is consisted of, what type of windows they have, installation, all that type of thing. I can then make informed decisions on either how to improve the house or how to get the person operating the house to do a better job. This is a really important thing. A lot of people feel scared about making this data accessible, about sharing this information. I think landlords or you as a homeowner should be more comfortable with interacting with data like this and being able to make informed decisions. This, I think, is the future. This idea of unlocking data within, uh, within the building space. This is an antiquated industry at the moment. There's been hardly any innovation in getting continuous data feedback from homes. A lot of people are scared of it, but I think uh, as homes become smarter and healthier, uh, that interaction with the data becomes quite an important thing to get your head around. I had an interesting, just going back onto, onto Bob's uh, funny idea around his, his person turning blue. I thought about gamifying environmental quality by creating a Tamagotchi, digital Tamagotchi. Uh, if, you've ever, if you know what the Tamagotchi is, it's basically a virtual pet. And then allowing kids to interact with this virtual Tamagotchi um, based on real data coming from your property. And if you don't look after the home, then the Tamagotchi dies, right? So if your room gets too cold, you can move into your room and you can actually see the Tamagotchi starting to freeze or, or if there's too much CO2 starting to choke up. So just little interesting things that you can do when you have uh, accurate real-time contextual data or other uh, abilities um, uh, performance. So this is just another slide on data is the key. Um, connecting a home and understanding what you can connect, things like environmental quality, measuring for thermal comfort, for uh, ventilation, things like energy consumption. These become real interesting data points to deal with. And then that data can be used to drive change, both from an operating perspective, but also from a, from a retrofit to upgrade point of view. Understanding how an upgrade actually works and if there is a return on investment is also something worth looking at. So, if I have a home that's not performing so well, I put an upgrade in and then I see what the step change in environmental quality and energy consumption is based on that. That's something that I can use as a data point to, to, to sell um, or to, to verify that what I've done actually works. No point in putting in new windows and insulation if you can't verify that what that's done is actually improved the living conditions and energy efficiency of that house. So this is a continuous improvement model that I think should be used continuously. So the idea is to model the property, understand exactly what it's uh, possible or how, what it can, what it's capable of performing like, installing monitoring to verify that the model is correct. And then if it's not correct, making data-driven solutions in order to change that. There is a finance uh, part to that, obviously, because improvements require finance. Um, and improvements can range anything from you know, very expensive to, to cost-effective. But the good thing about this is you can update the model. And when you update the model, you can then monitor the impact and the circle goes round and round. So this continuous improvement model becomes something that you can leverage um, and ensure that the environment gets better and better and better, both from a construction point of view, but also from an operational um, perspective as well. I flew through that because I know we only had <laughs> 10 minutes. So if you have any questions, just um, think about it. Think about evidence, think about data. It is absolutely imperative. And those that are not scared to use data uh, to back their claims up will win, I think, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, apologies for cutting your time short there. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, some really important messages uh, to, to finish off uh, from today. I'll put some links up there to the uh, Superhome website, of course. We've got some great resources and there is some uh hopefully some events coming up uh, some of those hopefully this year will be in-person events uh, looking to uh, get into uh, tours again um pending lockdowns and and all the rest of it so um 
thank you to everyone for speaking today. I haven't put up all the links up, but you can find uh, Tether, you can find Terralana, NK Windows, you can find all those and more. Uh, some of the supporters, participants, great products, but also really, really great information on the Superhome website. And of course, uh, also the Healthy Home Design Guide. And I'll put the links up to that as well so that people can uh, check that out. Um, one of the first questions, oh, so um, I'm aware that we've we've gone a little bit over time. So if you do have to rush off, um, thank you for coming today. Um, but uh, I'll just leave the chat open for a few moments if people do want to hang around and um, uh, ask any questions while we are online. Um, so yeah, thanks thanks to all those speakers. Uh, we did get a question about uh, where the checklist is, and I'll put some links up there in the chat. So uh, the resources are available on the Healthy Home uh, guide website. Damien, did you want to say anything else about resources, checklists, anything available uh, through the Healthy Home Design Guide? Uh, no, uh, Matthew, just just everyone just get on the guide, go through the guide and and, and have a look at the guide. Um, that's all I ask is, mm -hmm. is um, look at the document and, and, and use it and give me some feedback on give me some feedback on how it will work. Or how it works. That's what I really want. Cool. Uh, a couple of good questions from Tony. Uh, he asked about where, how the uh, the the levels proposed in the healthy home guide compare with passive house. Um, so, in the bridge analogy, the guide helps people go from where we are today to passive house in terms of energy, health, and comfort. Uh, but bear in mind that Passive House is really looking at indoor air quality and energy consumption. Passive House doesn't look after any of those other aspects like waste or even durability, resilience. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing about earthquakes in, in Passive House. So uh, Passive House is certainly a really great target in terms of air tightness and uh, air primary energy consumption. So 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum uh, energy is the target for passive house. We were saying 45 is a, is a, is a good uh, step in that direction. Um, Healthy Home Guide suggests that three air changes uh, is, is a great um, starting point. Passive house would say you yeah, would be down at, at 0 0.6. So it's a, it's, it's a bridge to get to that level of performance bearing in mind that Passive House is really looking at those really fundamentals of indoor air quality, ventilation, health and energy consumption. Um, but then once you've got that right, you can uh, add on some of those really other important sustainability aspects. Um, I had a question about cost and uh, I see that you responded to that in the chat there, Bob, in terms of cost. I'm gonna push back a little bit on that because I kind of, it's a question that we love to hate. And I suggest that asking about the price per square meter of a project is absolutely the wrong question to be asking. What we need to be talking about as per Bob's discussion about the, uh, the, the, um, the, the modeling, um, the, the total cost of ownership is what we need to, to look at. So that dashboard should look at not just the upfront cost, but what are the ongoing costs? What are the health costs? What are the wider implications of the cost? Now, obviously that's not gonna happen. I understand that everyone uses price per square meter as uh, the metric to compare things against each other, but it is absolutely the wrong question to be asking. Yeah, if I could just say a couple of things about that, Matthew. The the, the idea of being more spatially efficient and just building space that you're going to use is a way to save some money to allow you to put more into the quality of the home. And, um, you know, I think there's two things. There's price and there's cost. Price is what it costs you to attain something. Cost is what it costs you to own it over time. I am also aware that we are constrained by the realities of, of uh, banks uh, lending people and they that is one of their criteria. If you're trying to get a loan for a house, they'll, they'll want to, to look at those things. These are unfortunate realities that we have to deal with. Um, 
but we need to, to push on through together and keep pushing back on the industry and say, look, these are the important uh, things that we need to consider beyond just these fairly uh, simple and ineffective metrics. Uh, and then there was some uh, other discussion there about what we think should be mandatory in upcoming revisions to things like the building code. Uh, that's a really great point. Um, I've certainly got some ideas about that. And uh, Bob, I think you've put some, uh, some of your ideas about what you'd like to see as mandatory minimums in any future revisions. Yeah, it's, it's really the, the minimum healthy home, I think, base. the base, base standard. Uh, not everybody can afford to do better and best, but everybody should be able to do base. And um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it is a challenge. Everybody's on a budget and, and everybody's even struggling just to build any house. But um, there's no point in creating a legacy of unhealthy homes for the future. Absolutely. Um, so for those that aren't uh, familiar what we're talking about there, the um, base, better, best uh, are laid out in the matrix on the healthy home guide, not the matrix that's behind Damien in his screen there. <laughs> but that is a subtle reference to the fact that we, there is a matrix in the uh, design guide, which is there as a useful tool, uh, just as Damien showed with that checklist so that you can actually go along and, and have those conversations either with clients or with designers, builders, um, your bank, whoever, that you need to have that conversation with. All right, um, well, I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up. Uh, unless there's any final comments from, uh, from Bob or Damien. Um, just my final comment would be, you can't learn everything that you need to know about how to create a healthy home from a 15 minute talk. So we have um, guided tours uh, open once a month of the, the Super Home HQ, which was the 10 star home. We have uh, the tours coming up. We have workshops, uh, hopefully, throughout the country. Uh, one in Auckland, Tamati Makovid, hopefully soon. <coughs> we'll, we'll put a mask on and come up. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, look out for the Super Home events and uh, get involved. Because awesome. things don't change when you don't get involved. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for taking your time out of your day and yeah, head on over to the Superhome uh, website, superhome.co.nz for more information. And also you'll find links there to the uh, Healthy Home Guide, uh, which you can also follow the links in the chat there. I'll leave this open for uh, a little bit. So if you do want to hang around, say hello, uh, chat, more than welcome. Otherwise, really appreciate your time. Um, and uh, I've got some homeschooling going on, so I better go and check on the kids as well and uh, <laughs> enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Matthew. I'll turn off recording as well. So if anyone wants to uh, ask in.